In this clip, I thought I would talk a little bit about data analysis and particularly coding approaches in the qualitative research method, interpretive phenomenological analysis. An important piece of orientation or background here is that approaches to qualitative analysis tend not to be tremendously prescriptive about what you do to the data what you call the strategies you use, the order you work through them. Um, instead, what they're offering you is a way of thinking about the data, um, a theoretical vocabulary for um, identifying features of the data that are relevant to the approach that you've taken. There are some exceptions to that. So some versions of grounded theory are very procedural and have got very strict expectations about how you ought to go through it, but most qualitative methods are framed in terms of their epistemological lens, what they think it's possible to know about the data. And so what most methodological writing is doing is, is trying to get you um, to look through the, the right lenses um, and think, in this case, in a phenomenological way about um, what experiences might mean and how we might make sense of people's relationship to the things in their life world that are important to them. That's how RPA would think about what it's doing. So if you look at methodological writing on IPA, you look at methods chapters, you'll see there's a range of different strategies being offered to you and a range of different vocabularies being offered in terms of the way that different authors uh, describe the process of doing IPA. It's not that some of those are right and some are wrong, it's just that people are trying to offer up different ways of applying the principles, of looking through the lens um, in a way that's consistent with IPA and which might resonate with a reader and help them to understand how they might do it. So the caveat here is I'm going to talk about some strategies that I find useful in my own work. If we're thinking about common processes and principles, then um, in IPA often we're moving from the particular, the ideographic, the case level, to the shared, to what's um, codable or identifiable across cases. And we're often moving from very micro level details to more macro level patterns of understanding. Um, often these are framed in terms of um, common ways of making sense of a particular experience or phenomenon in the, in the world of the participants. And as we do that, we're um, trying to maintain a commitment to understanding the participants' point of view and particularly thinking about them as making sense of their experiences in very specific contexts and trying to keep the different contexts of that sense making um, alive and part of our part of our thinking and discussion. In most kinds of qualitative analysis, where you're trying to get to is to have identified some patterns of meaning in the data and to draw those together into some kind of structure so that you can produce a narrative that takes the reader through that structure section by section so that they understand what the important patterns of meaning are in the data. In IPA's um, uh, framework, uh, typically those patterns are called themes, and a theme is telling you what something meant to your participants. So it's not identifying a topic that people talked about, it's telling you about the meaning of something that people talked about, what, what they were telling you about, how they felt about it, thought about it, their relationship to something that was significant for them. In IPA, you're often starting the coding in, um, in the, at the mi micro level. So you're working in detail with a single case and you're working way up, your way up to a case level um, set of clusters of the raw material from which your themes will be built. And then you're looking across those case level summaries in order to identify themes, patterns of meaning that cut across the cases. And often a good way to start, oops, <laughs> a good way to start is by doing some reflection, thinking a little bit about your initial reactions to the data. Have a pass through the data and allow yourself to be wrong. Make notes on anything that catches your attention, whether it's because it resonates with you personally, because it's reminding you of things that you were interested in to begin with, um, because it's connecting with theoretical curiosities that you had that brought you to the topic. None of those things are particularly phenomenological, but it's good to notice them. And in a way, it's good to capture that thinking so that you can reduce the level of that noise at the next stage of coding and focus a bit more on what the text is telling you. Some of that material you may come back to. It may be that when you've done the more detailed work, 
you can come back to some of these things that seemed important um, and work out whether they still are, whether they're sustainable, whether there is a dialogue with theory or whether something that struck you as very powerful at the beginning or resonated with your personal experience actually does merit the attention that you, um, that you wanted to give it. So this is just about capturing what you notice um, so that that's not bothering you so much and you can get on with the business of uh, a more detailed reading of what's in the transcript. So these are three strategies which I would often use side by side and which I think make for a very helpful way of thinking about what you can do in the early stage coding with IPA that's consistent with an interpretive phenomenological way of thinking. So I would typically go through and I would identify all the things that matter to the participants. These are what we might call objects of concern. They're the stuff that make up the participants' life world. They might be people, events, relationships, processes, beliefs, concepts, but they're the things that people talk about. And very often alongside those things, you'll also see um, cues to the meaning of those things. And these are what I would call experiential claims. They're claims about what, what it's like to be um, connected to those things in a particular way. Uh, so often here you're noticing the more evaluative or affective or appraising kind of language that people use to describe the things that populate their world. So a thing might be a hospital. Um, if I tell you that I'm uh, worried and frightened about going to hospital, you can describe my relationship as being uh, to, to the concept of hospital as being uh, uh, captured by, by those uh, emotional adjectives. Um, and so we're building up clusters of, uh, of meanings that are attached to different things. What you'll notice is that often it comes around in that order that you notice the thing and then you notice the, um, the emotional or uh, evaluative language attached to it. But sometimes it's the other way around that you'll, you'll get clusters of um, uh, powerful language, but it'll be quite difficult to work out what they refer to. Particularly when people choose to tell you stories about things, you might have to do the interpretive work in order to name the, the object of concern, the thing that, that people are, are telling you about. I'll give examples of these things in, in future clips. And the third strategy that often works alongside that is a kind of zooming out. So these are quite micro level bits of line by line coding, but coding for stance involves just pulling back a little bit and looking at sequences and chunks of data and trying to identify adjectives which you could use to describe the participants' relationship to the topic or their relationship to you or what they're doing in the way that they're talking about that topic right now. And keeping track of the shifting stance of the participant is quite a nice way of thinking about, um, at a more global level, uh, what this topic might mean to your participants and, and how they might be managing it when they try to make sense of it with you in an interview or some other kind of data collection event. So I would often use these three strategies side by side, flipping, flipping and flopping between them if you like, um, in parallel uh, in, in order to do my initial pass through the data. And I, I tend to find that they're very complementary, that if I get stuck with one, if I, then I can alternate to the other strategy and that will unlock something and allow me to continue to make progress. So they work really well together. Um, and, and they're certainly worth a, uh, a try. There are examples of these in a chapter that I wrote with Andrew Thompson um, on, on IPA, which is in a book that Andrew edited with Dave Harper. You can easily find that, um, that chapter online.